Okay. Um, hello, and welcome to the Thursday, March 15th regular meeting of the school committee. We have need of an executive session um, for the purposes of discussing strategy with respect to negotiations with non-unit personnel, the assistant superintendent, the chair having declared that an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on um, the committee's strategy and ability to negotiate. So I need a motion to uh, move into executive session. So moved. And a second. Second. Uh, that's a motion by Nancy, a second by Mina. Mina? Yes. Uh, Jen? Yes. Um, Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes. So we will can, um, we will move into executive session and we will come back to uh, regular session and continue with our meeting at 7 o'clock. Thank you. All right, ready? Okay. okay. Um, hello, and welcome back to the March 15th um, regular meeting of the school committee. We did open our meeting at 6.30, and we had need of an executive session. Um, and so we are now ready to enter our regular session. And I will start by asking you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I'll quickly read through the agenda, and then we have some great recognitions to start off our meeting. Um, so first, we will do recognitions, followed by our first opportunity for public comment. Following that, we'll have reports to the school committee. We'll have a student council report, um, the acting superintendent's report, school committee chair report, liaison reports, and FY. 2018 budget update. Under new business, we will um, take up the appointment of the assistant superintendent. We'll review the bids for the turf field project. Um, we'll um, have a discussion of the campus master plan stage one. We'll review the memorandum of understanding between Parks and Recreation and the school committee regarding the turf, the operation and management of the turf fields. Then we'll take up school committee policy KF, community use of school facilities, followed by school committee policy ADDA, criminal record information, um, and then school committee policy ADA philosophy. Following that, we'll have a discussion and a vote about a student activities account. We'll review some budget transfers, and we will review the statement of interest and vote on the statement of interest for the, for the Elmwood School. Under old business, we'll continue our discussion of the FY19 budget, um, and we will review the athletic field subcommittee membership um, and update that. Following all that, we'll have our second opportunity for public comment, followed by items by consensus, and we're really hoping to adjourn by 10 p.m. Okay? So, without further ado, Dr. Kavanaugh, would you like to invite our guests up to join us? I certainly would. So, um, I would like all of you scientists to come on up and be recognized. Maybe, maybe we can, can have Mrs. Murphy all introduce them. Okay. Come on over here. Come on over yeah. here. That way you're really so there, on camera. There are microphones over there <laughs> so they can hear you on TV. Would you like to come up and, yes, that yes. would be awesome. Thank you. Do I have to speak into a microphone? Yes, or near so they can, he can hear you. You can have a seat if you like, actually, more comfortable. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for having us. I'm Kristen Baldiga Murphy, um, and this is my first year being the coordinator of the Science and Engineering Fair at Hopkinton High School. So we want to first thank you for um, inviting us to your meeting, and thank you so much, the school committee and the administration at the school, for your support of this really important and special program at Hopkinton High School. This was an especially um, exciting year because it was the 30th anniversary of our science fair and so it was started 30 years ago by Valerie Lachansky who's still our department chair and really involved in the science fair and it's grown into a really wonderful and unique part of the Hopkinton High School curriculum. This year we had 50 students participate with almost 30 projects um, and these are a few of the projects that have either won at the school fair or the regional fair and they'll all be participating at the MIT State Fair in early May. So we're really excited for you to hear more about their projects. Um, and I just want to 
say a quick word about why I think this program is so exciting. And some of you were here during the fair in late February, but it's one of the best days of the year. As a science teacher, I love seeing students engaging in real, authentic research. But I think more importantly, it's so much fun to walk around and see when you give teenagers a chance to study and work on any topic that they choose, these students all pick something that they're passionate about and they're excited about and they want to solve a problem that makes a difference. And that's, as an educator and as someone who's really optimistic about the future, to see that they choose things like um, sustainability and biodegradable plastics and how can we reduce pollution or how can we address the opioid crisis or how can we uh, help with things like heart disease or even credit scores and identity theft, things that as a teenager I wasn't thinking about. It's so obvious that kids from Hopkinton are using their intelligence and their passion and their creativity to solve problems that are really important. And that's just kind of ask for more from our students and that's the best part of being part of this program. So I'm excited for you to hear more about their projects and we really thank you and the HBTA especially for their support. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm Himanchu. Uh, I'm a senior, Hoppington High School. Uh, I'm Rohan. I'm a freshman at Hoppington High School. Uh, so this is our science fair project. Uh, we developed the Intelligent Cloud-Based Medication Dispensing and Scheduling System, or ICMD, to help prevent and deter accidental and unintentional overdosing. Uh, as you may know, our society faces a serious opioid epidemic. And in 2016, 64,000 people died as a result of overdosing on opioids. According to a major news organization, more people died as a result of overdosing on opioids than the entire amount of Americans that died in the 20-year period of the Vietnam War. When we read the statistic, we were shocked. So we decided to do more research into the underlying cause. What we found out is that the number one cause of accidental and unintentional death in the United States is due to overdosing on opioids. And in Massachusetts alone, in the past 15 years, over 11,000 people, uh, 11, people have died solely from accidental and unintentional overdosing. Uh, so to address this problem of accidental and unintentional overdosing, we set out to design our own hardware and software system, which seeks to enforce strict prescription drug schedules. And the reason for this is because people who become addicted to opioids likely aren't uh, what we would consider traditional drug addicts, uh, but they are in fact people with chronic pain who have been prescribed opioids. Uh, and because they're in chronic pain, they'll take more of their medication than they should be taking. Um, so this builds a tolerance and can ultimately lead to addiction. So uh, this is the hardware uh, right here. Um, and it's connected via Bluetooth to an application which runs on a patient's phone and a caretaker's phone. And the software system knows uh, when to dispense pills and what quantity to dispense pills. Um, it can store two different types of pills. So uh, different from your traditional pill bottle, which can only store, store one type of medication. Um, and there's a system of checks and balances in place. So if someone tries to take too much of a medication, uh, the pill bottle will deny uh, the extra dosage. Uh, but if it's a person's in serious pain, an override request can be sent to a caretaker who can review a log of previous medication history, what's in the bottle, uh, and approve or deny this request. And what we hope that this will do is it'll reduce the number of people who uh, build a tolerance to medication and ultimately become addicted. It's amazing. It's a great wow. idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. I had I got to see it actually like work yesterday and it, it I mean it's really remarkable. It dispenses, you know, exactly on the timer and comes out the little thing at the bottom. It's really I, I know we all have people in our lives, parents and grandparents that could certainly benefit from this kind of organization. Um, but yeah, that's that's really really remarkable. Thank you. Is there an app connected to this that you've built, which should be? Yeah, so uh, we've actually designed an application uh, which runs on a patient's smartphone, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, so there's information about what's actually in the bottle, uh, the quantity of medication, uh, the type of medication, and it actually uses biometric authentication to ensure that the person who's dispensing the pill uh, is also the person who intends to consume uh, the medication. So you're not going to have a child act using your phone and dispensing a pill. And how long did it take you to devise and come up with all of this? Um, so we started our project in about September, and we worked on it until the school fair in February, and we've continued to make changes until now. Wow. Fantastic. Amazing. What an achievement in such a short time. Thank you.
Great job. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. MIT is going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. They were first place at our school fair. Namaj has actually won first place three years in a row, so he's graduating this year, leaving very big shoes to fill. No kidding. More great ideas in the future, um, and they finished in the top ten at the regionals. Wow. wow. So you, you're mentoring, a, a, you say you're a freshman? Yeah, I'm a You're freshman. senior? Yeah. yeah so you, you're, you're trying to build up so that next year you're equal success, right? Yeah. 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 Good, <laughs> good. Hopefully he beats me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. We have representation from every grade. So oh, we that's have great. lots of bright stars in the future of the program, which is great. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Should we just like rotate? Sure. Yeah, that works. Okay. So, hi, I'm Alexa Benak. Um, I don't know how loud this is, <laughs> but... Do you want to sit? Yeah, sure. Sit. Be great. And then we can just switch. Sit oh, it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Alexa. I'm Sarah. I'm Eva. And our project was synthetic and bioplastic degradation using Galleria melanella. So Galleria melanella is commonly referred to as the waxworm, and they live in beehives, and they basically eat the wax and prevent it from building up, like constantly. Um, so basically there was um, accidental research found where a woman accidentally, well she didn't accidentally, but she put them in a bag and they ended up eating their way through a synthetic bag. And so we wanted to find a solution to the plastic crisis and for the past two years we've sort of been around the whole topic of bioplastics and degradation as well. Um, so this year we wanted to look at how Galleria melanella or the waxworms would degrade the synthetic and the non-synthetic plastics as well. Um, in order to see if there would be any sort of difference in terms of how like their structure affects the rate at which they eat them um, because we want to find a solution to the plastic crisis because we know that as the next generation we're going to have to take on the problems that are associated with overproduction of plastic and how it's building up in our landfills. Yeah, so the basic premise of our project was that we took these gallery melanella and placed them in um, a box with different samples of plastic. So we used different starches as well as a synthetic or a petroleum based plastic that was high density polyethylene plastic, which is just like a basic shopping bag. So we placed these in with the gallery melanella and monitored the physical and mass changes over the time. So we were able to notice different changes in their holes, like we, holes were starting to form, as well as the general change in mass. So based on our results, uh, we found holes in both the synthetic plastic and the biodegradable plastic, but mostly in the synthetic plastic, which we think is a great thing because synthetic plastic is the one that needs to help biodegrading, or well, not biodegrading, but just degrading. Um, and then for before the state fair, we're curious about researching about the actual bacteria or the enzyme that's actually doing the digestion of the plastic. So we're working on trying to isolate that before the next um, state fair. Wow, that's awesome. So interesting. Amazing. I don't even understand most of what you said, except that, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I usually have that problem. But um, I mean, I, I'm seeing a theme, but I just think it's incredible that you start, all of you are starting with a problem that you see in the world that you want. I mean, those are big yeah. challenges, very daunting challenges, and you're you know, jumping right in and plugging away at it and making progress. I think that's incredible. Um, I'm just really blown away by what you're doing, and I hope that you will keep us posted on your progress. I, like, it's making me feel itchy because you're talking about, like, worms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I really, I, I, I hope you'll come back and tell us as your prog progress, project um, progresses what you're finding. And, I mean, I, you know, this is just amazing that you, you're finding a solution to a problem that, we created for you that we don't know how to solve. So thank you <laughs> thank very you. much. Thank you so much. I, I do have a couple of questions. Yeah. Where did you get this sample from? Of, did you say Galleria Melanella? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, good. They came from North Carolina. We yeah, think? from like a supply company, just yeah. like a general science supply company. Yeah, so they're not them, uncommon so throughout the US. they come in the mail? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got little containers of them. I was just wondering if I'll be able to pronounce the name even. Um, <laughs> did you, what was the other word you used? Waxworms, is that right? Waxworms, yeah. That's like what they're commonly referred to. I see. And uh, were you able to do it in the labs here at the high school? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, excellent, excellent. And you continue to work on this and research? Is yeah. <laughs> We're trying to figure out if it's um, a bacteria in their gut as opposed to an enzyme in their saliva. So we're sort of devising two different plans in, in order to see if it's one of them's the enzyme and then the other one's the bacteria. So that's where we're hoping to go within the next couple of weeks. Wow. Exciting. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's pretty cool. I'm just impressed having been able to pronounce mm -hmm. the name. I know, right? <laughs> Welcome. I wasn't even going to go there. I uh, my name is Tyler Rhodes. I'm a sophomore here, and I did a project with my friend Adroit, who cannot be here today. And uh, we developed a machine learning algorithm that can find correlations between people's lifestyle habits and heart disease. So pretty much what it does is it takes what we use as a CDC database, and it can analyze that database, and it has a series of questions listing from, do you wear a seatbelt, how active are you, do you have asthma, tobacco usage, and it can assign numerical values to that data set uh, basing on how correlated and how anti-correlated it is with having heart disease. And this is really useful because people like every day are wondering how is how is my choice today going to impact my future health and heart the reason why we chose heart disease is because it's the number one killer between males and females within the United States and it personally affects uh, it's heavily prevalent in my family and my partner's a droids family and we really wanted to see if we could use this software to help find and influence people's future lifestyle decisions based around it. And what we found is we were able to take the data set and we found the top five correlators and top anti-correlators and we were able to compare it with the CDC research that was prior done on heart disease and allowed us to find accuracy of our algorithm. And what we found is from the variables that we had and that the CDC had is there was heavy overlap. So we were able to determine that our algorithm was accurate and we are able to use it for future applications such as other diseases. And currently we are going through cancer data from the CDC and we're also searching for some Alzheimer's public data. And that way we could apply the same algorithm to those diseases and help influence uh, lifestyle factors. That's incredible. Have you changed some behaviors of people in your family based on your research? Uh, not yet, no. <laughs> still early though it's only been since September right yeah yeah no, that's amazing mm -hmm. and what were some of the inputs um, you know what do you expect someone to input and what is the interface that they use to input this information so currently we're developing a uh, user interface that is currently we have a spreadsheet this is 81 questions these are the same questions on the CDC database and you can answer yes or no and based on that answer you output a uh, percentage from 0 to 100 and what you, so like when we input all pretty much bad answers, we call them. So like you smoke every day, you drink a ton of alcohol and so on. You have like a 99.99% .99 chance of having heart disease. And if you do like everything well, you don't smoke, you are very active, you have good health, you have a like close to 0% chance. Can you, like if you take, if you take the, if you do the analysis and then let's say, you know, I don't exercise very much. So then I do it again and I change that and I say I do exercise very much. Mm -hmm. Would it show me like the difference I could make? By yeah, making so that one every change? time you change one of the questions, it changes your percent risk of having it. So, like, it starts, a baseline is 50% if you have like nothing, and based on like each question you answer, either it goes higher or lower. But so I could learn for myself, yes. like, the impact of one single choice on the percentage chance mm -hmm. that I would have. That's, that's, ex that's very. Concrete. That's mm -hmm. great. Is wow. this something we can access? <laughs> uh, once we uh, put it on interface, yeah. Cool. Thank so I'll you. Be assessing Thank our life expectancy. Maybe, we'll, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we don't reveal those results on HCAM, but <laughs> I, I would like to take the test. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, hi, so uh, my name is uh, Fateh Mohammed, and uh, I'm a freshman at Hopkinton High School. And my project is a blockchain-based credit history management system. So it all begins in 1989 when the U.S. government decided to concentrate our most sensitive data in the hands of three giant finance corporations, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. So these corporations now store our biographic information, every address we ever lived at, and every major financial transaction we've ever made. This is all so they can assign us a FICO credit score. So this system is archaic, ineffective, and not suited for 21st century. The following are a few statistics showing just that. In the US, an identity theft happens once every two seconds. In 2016, consumers lost $16 billion to identity theft. And worst of all, on September 8, 2017, 
Equifax announced the worst data breach in history, and they and for three months, hackers had unrestricted access to the records of 144 million Americans, which is 44% of the population, 55 million British, which is 67% of the population, wow. and a few thousand Canadians. So the root problem today is that third parties own, control, and share arguably the most important factor in the adult American's life, and that is their credit history. So I propose and I built a system that allows consumers to control, share, and ultimately own their own credit histories. So my system is a decentralized application which stores this data on a blockchain. It uses cryptography and mathematics to secure that data. And then it uses economics to incentivize lenders like banks and consumers like you and I to use the system. Wow, that's chilling. It's yeah. a really you know. good idea because I was one of those 55 million you Americans. Were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. in the experience. So, yeah, that's a fantastic idea to kind of get it out of the general and, and own it for yourself until you're ready to use it. It's a really good idea. Thank you. Yeah, that's and amazing. So, how do you make it available to, um, you know, if you want to make a purchase, the way the credit scores function and they're heavily used uh, by, you know, many, many vendors out there? So how would you uh, share your information and how can they trust that what you have shared is reliable? Yeah, so what you would do is, um, you would first you would freeze your credit history okay. on you know the major credit bureaus and then you'd have to port your existing credit history onto this new system. And then you'd be given a wallet which will give you, and you'll be given two keys and that'll give you control of your system. And it's mathematically and crypto cryptographically provable um, using the aspects of a blockchain that like this data is not that's one of the aspects of a blockchain that the data cannot be tampered with fantastic I know. this is a very humbling conversation <laughs> right um, I, I really cannot thank you guys enough and, and to you um, Kristen for, for doing this and I wish you were here um, but I just am sitting here so struck by what Valerie has built over 30 years it's just absolutely remarkable and I mean you guys make us look so good I, I'm so proud of everything that you have done I'm blown away by how smart you are and how creative you are and how savvy you are um, and I thank you for applying your skills to problems that affect everybody every day and I think it gives I think you said this just makes you feel optimistic for the future in a way that sometimes we don't so um, Will you keep us posted on your progress at the next level? I have no doubt that you'll be very, very successful. I'm just so proud of all of you. Thank you so much. And what is the for date for the next one? I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. What is that? May 4th. OK. Amazing. Right. And I'll leave you um, the program from the school fair and then our oh, results at the school and thank regional you. fair. Oh, That's thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. We oh, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. It's impressive it's all pleasure. the work that's gone into this. Not just really smart and creative individuals, but really hardworking, I'm sure, to get these projects done. It makes a big difference to have the support of the administration to to give teachers the time and stipends and funding and the HBTA oh. gives a huge amount of money. So Lex giving us money, Bose volunteers, mentors. So great. it takes a village, definitely. But I think you can see it's a really important and, and really unique part of our curriculum because they all come up with these projects themselves. Yeah. So. It's That's incredible. Great. Thank, thank you. you. So well, thank you. Thank you to thank all you. the teachers mm -hmm. for inspiring the kids to care and do something. Thank so you. So thank you. Thank you guys you aren't going to stay for the rest of our meeting. It's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <laughs> go work on your project. Yeah, they got to go work on their project. Yeah, I'm like glitching over the idea. Anytime anybody says worms, it's really the worms. freaking me out. That was I know the worms are awesome. Really yeah, amazing. That's my claim oh, to fame. Yeah. That I can pronounce. Can pronounce I was just going to say wax worms. I, know. I wasn't going to try. I'm just going to All right. Well, that, that's um, a hard act to follow, but... I have one you, more recognition. Yes, go right ahead. Yes. So our second recognition tonight, you can see that they are not here. And they are not here because they are enjoying their banquet before they head off to Springfield tomorrow. I am referring to the girls varsity basketball team who beat Northampton last night, 48 to 40, I believe. And so on Saturday, they are playing for the state champions. Um, and they are playing against Foxborough in Springfield at 11 o'clock. If anyone is interested in going to the game, hopefully next time we are together, they will be here as victors. It's so, so exciting. It's really exciting. We have not made it this far in the tournament. I don't. In, and I have a long memory. In a, in, in a, 
ever. So yes. really kudos and great, great group of girls. They worked so hard. It was so exciting. I'm sure the opportunity to play at the Hall of Fame is, oh, it has to feel yeah. really amazing to them. It's been fun watching, following their, um, I haven't been to the games, but following it along the sidelines of how successful they've been and the excitement it generates. Yeah, mm. yeah, very exciting. Awesome. All right. Well, now we have our first opportunity for public comment, but we have Good no time. members of the public, so we'll pick up a little time um, and move right into reports to the school committee. We do not have any student council members here um, to give a report, but I think we just heard loud and clear from some really impressive students, so <laughs> I think we're good on that for tonight. So that brings us to um, Dr. Kavanaugh's report, so I'll turn it over to you. Yes. So. I'm going to start with snow. <laughs> no. oh, I think I was in this role for seven days and we had three cancellations. Uh, so that puts us, I believe, to Wednesday, June 20th as the final day of school. But I would also like to take a moment to thank our buildings and grounds crew and um, Mike Manser and his team. I can't tell you how much communication I received from them, the work that they have done. They've worked tirelessly. If I call them at 11 o'clock at night, they're up. If I call them at 2 in the morning, they're up. If you call them right before school starts, they are up. They are up all night long removing snow and getting our roads and school buildings ready for opening. And there were many schools that had to cancel a second day this week, and we were lucky to get in with a two-hour delay, and I think it's because of how hard they worked. So I'm very grateful. Incredible. And my last report is on the walkout. Uh, both Mr. Keller and Mr. Bishop have said that they were marvelously successful in both buildings. And I think what I really like about that is that the kids had the autonomy to go to their administrators, uh, discuss what that was going to look like, work very collaboratively with the adults in the building. Half of the students partook in the walkouts in both buildings. The other half stayed in class, and education was not disrupted. Uh, but I even like that we had some kids who had sort of the strength and fortitude to say, this isn't for me. So I think on both sides, the, the civic lesson was learned, and, and that was our goal. So it was great. Um, all right, so the school committee chair report um, we have received several emails this week, but they were all related to various policies, so I can share that with you when we get to the policy discussions. Um, so other than that, I just will announce that I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 18-059 and 18-060. All of the warrants have been included in your packet. Um, and I also have a budget update, but I will do that later. So we can just move on to liaison reports. Does anybody have any liaison reports? I have one. Um the elementary school building committee met um, Monday and um, they have some great things going on um, in the um, agenda that they included several photos of the school that really just looks like a school now it's really cool to see the inside um, I think the last time I gave a report there were some concerns about tiles um, and potential delays but they um, they got in there on the weekend, they finished it, and were able to um, stay on schedule, which is really ahead of schedule, so they're doing great. Um, two of the things that came from that meeting, um, uh, Mike Shepard is kind of spearheading along with Lauren Dubow a time capsule mm -hmm. to be put in the building, which is, is really cool, so um, they're working on that. And then, um, I guess there's three things. <laughs> Lots of arrangements are, are being made for um, the furnishings and the turno turning over of the school to the town. Um, and then also, um, the, I guess this is kind of including, included with my last comment there, turning, it, turning the building over to the town. Um, one of the important things, especially with regard to safety, is that the, the school is being completely rekeyed so that um, the master keys that exist for the school department will not be, no one will, you know, there, there's not going to be any cause for concern that there'll be um, anything extra hanging out there for as we turn it over to the town. So um, things are really happening. Wow. They're talking about the ribbon cutting ceremony and, and when that, you know, how to get that going. So anyway, great things happening. Very exciting. Fantastic. When we were on site visits this week, um, one of the schools that we visited was new in <laughs> Mrs. DeBow was actually down on the floor, pushing on the floor, saying, this is the floor that we're going to have. Did you see her? She was like, I was like, 
can't talk on that today, but she was down checking it out. She's she was very excited, excited. <laughs> certainly in command of every detail of what's happening in that um, in that new building. So it's really exciting. Oh, so awesome to see her face when they're showing updates and things that have been completed. Just to watch Lauren's face, she's so it's great, great that she's being, you know, getting this finally. Um, and the other thing, I, I don't have a report, but I know that the Center School Reuse Committee met last night. Um, so I have yet to get any information about what went down last night, but um, but I know they're they're also they're working in conjunction with the elementary school building committee to get that transition going as well. Excellent, great, thank you. Yep. Did you have anything, Mina? Um, I've had a couple of meetings, but nothing significant to report. I mean, um, the community communication group we are meeting tomorrow. We actually have a check meeting tomorrow, um, so I'll have updates for the next time. Okay. Great. Nancy, do you have anything? I don't have any reports. I think actually you've been at most of the meetings I was at. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just quickly say that we did have a meeting about um, the farewell to the center school um, process. And so we, you know, there's a great group of people working on it right now. We're targeting um, having an event on the same day as Poly Arts so that it will overlap with both Poly Arts as well as um, Hopkinton Family Day. Uh, so we will go to the Board of Selectmen. Actually, we realize we now have to ask permission of the Board of Selectmen to use the center school in September because it will not <laughs> any longer be under the custody, care, and control of the school department. And you just said we won't even have the keys. Right. So um, <laughs> we won't be able to get in. That's right. So next steps, we'll go to the Board of Selectmen meeting, I think, on March 27th and ask for permission. And we'll share more about that as it develops. But um, that's really, aside from the athletic field subcommittee that we'll talk about later that, and budget, that's really all that I had to share. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll just move into, oh, I'm sorry. This is an FY 2018 budget update. Right. Is that you? I was thinking it was. 2018. 2019. Okay. 2019 is at the bottom of the agenda. All right. So, you, so then let me just, sorry, I'm going to back up then because I misread that. Um, under my chair report, I just wanted to, to read a recap of where we are. Um, based on meetings that have taken place, and then we'll have a further discussion when we get to that agenda item under old business. Um, but I did just want to let everyone know that we have been working collaboratively with a town manager and members of the Board of Selectmen towards a solution for this year for the FY19 budget. Beginning in November, the school committee has thoroughly examined the recommendations of the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and director of finance and operations for each school and department budget. As we work through this project, process, additional reductions were made to the operating budget, including teacher positions. In January, the school committee voted a budget that resulted in a 7.3% overall increase due to the following budget drivers. Special education, 2%, payroll, 3.6%, transportation, 1.1%, utilities for the new marathon school, 0.3%, occupational day, 0.05%, and expense, 0.25%. An additional reduction was subsequently made to reduce the transportation contract by an additional $181,000, bringing the current overall school department increase to 6.9%. At a joint meeting of the Board of Selectmen and the School Committee on Friday, March 9th, it was determined that Mr. Kamalo and Dr. McLeod would meet to determine a solution that would meet the following guidelines. An overall 5% tax impact to the town and a budget distribution that mirrors the FY18 budget allocations. To this end, Ms. Rothermick, Dr. Kavanaugh, and Dr. McLeod met with Mr. Kamalo and Mr. Hassett yesterday and learned that in order to meet these guidelines, the school department would need to make additional reductions to their operating budget in the amount of $715,000. While we have been aware of the potential for additional budget reductions and there have been ongoing discussions with the members of the administrative team, the details related to the additional reductions to the operating budget must be approved by the school committee. So towards that end, we have scheduled a working session with the school committee on Monday night at 6.30. Um, and we will um, hear from Dr. McLeod and Ms. Rothermick at that time about um, what their recommendations are going to be for further reductions going forward. So I just, uh, Dr. McLeod put together that very nice recap, and I wanted to make sure that I um, read that at the beginning of the meeting before people fall asleep. <laughs> so. Sorry, I miss I misread all of my my agenda things. So after that, now I'll turn that over to you for the FY18 budget update. Okay, thank you. Um, so you have the memo and the financial report in your packet. At this time, we're still running at a deficit. Currently, right now, it's around eighty-three thousand. 
Um, the drivers for this deficit continue to be special education, occupational day, and legal costs, which are, are running over um, the budgeted amount. Um, special education placements continue to change. Um, services that are required for students continue to change. Some have been to our benefit um, and, and some not. So this number will continue to change. Um, so, but it, this is where we are at this point in time. Every department is reviewing their spending, um, releasing funds for things that are already spent and came in under budget. So as we continue to march down uh, the fiscal year, we'll tighten this number up as we go along. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, you know, these are some of the questions I think we had exchanged emails over, if you don't mind going over these. Um, can you please share some details on, um, for the legal fees, why we are over 110 k And if you can speak a little bit to that as to why uh, such a shift, why are we so over? Um, so as you know, legal is, is an estimate, and over the past um, number of years typically we run around 50,000 so that that is typically and you never know what will happen during a during a fiscal year um, so last year our average monthly was just a little under 4,000 um, a month this year we're running over 13,000 a month in terms of what we're spending on legal costs so there's a couple of drivers this is a negotiation year so we've got contract negotiations um, for the HTA. That does incur some legal costs. Uh, the, one of the big abnormal, if you will, are the public record requests, which right now to date is running around 40,000. Um, last year we only spent less than 1,000. So these are the things that can happen, and you have to respond to them. So, but. If we continue at the rate that we're at, that was the projection. Okay. And I would imagine that you know the HTA contract that was something that you would have planned for. But why is it that you know the uh, the request for the public records? Why is it abnormally so high? Is there something uh, that we could have done uh, no. to prevent it? No. No. When someone makes a request, we are just legally bound to respond to it. Okay, anything else? Um, I do have a few more. Um, there was one line item related to tuition reimbursement. Um, you talked about HDA contracts uh, related to that. Can you speak a little bit as to why we are over um, 17 K on that? So again, um, it, we use an estimate on the number of requests for tuition reimbursement. So it is a, it is in the contract. Tuition reimbursement is part of the contract. We do an estimate every year on um, teachers will submit an intent to take a course for tuition reimbursement. Sometimes they don't always complete the course, and we don't end up having to pay that tuition until they do. This was a year where um, the percentage of the intents was much higher than history. Um, so it's just simply a, a function of the teachers put in their intent to take the course, and they took the course, and were obligated to do that tuition reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have a couple other questions, small items. Uh, one was the student athletic needs increase of 4.8K in the personnel sheet that you shared? So in the fall, uh, if you remember, um, Ms. King came and talked about the number of student athletes, I believe it was in cross country, mm -hmm. and the need for an additional um, coach for the safety of the students. So that was, that was a position that you actually approved in the fall. I see. Um, and then with regard to the Muni report on the high school, there is an item related to the Saturday school um, can you speak to that a little bit? What is Saturday school? Detention. Oh, okay. I see. So that's payment for supervision. Okay. I, I'd actually like to better understand that. Maybe uh, I'll spend some time with you to understand this detention. 
just just from my understanding. Sure. I mean, yeah. So they have to have supervision for the consequence. Right. Right. No, I I understand that part. Um, and then there are a couple of items on the high school where you have the Maastricht, which are over 100%. One was a new equipment, and the other one was the sped travel, uh, the special ed travel. It looks like it's over at 254%. So this year we did not receive one of our special education grants, and typically travel would have been written into that grant. Mm. So. It, the, the travel happens, you know, um, they go out and supervise um, vocational students that are out on vocational placements, and typically that would have been covered by the grant. So the travel still happens, but we lost the grant this year. See. And what is the reason why we lost the grant? They just changed the requirements Criteria. for the grant. So now, going into 2019, have you had to plan for this, and that is also one of the drivers for the increase in the budget? Well, we will we will have to, but I mean it's that's small money okay. in terms of the, the amount of money that we're looking at for the FY19. I see. And there was one last item related to the Norfolk tuition, which is again um, under occupational day, which mm -hmm. is over at 130 percent. Right. So that's just a function of more students going to Norfolk Aggie, which is a one of our vocational schools. Um, so more students go than we had anticipated in the budget. Yeah, I guess lots of unanticipated items, whether it be legal fees, whether it be spat travel, the big items, if you will, right. are some around that. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, let's move on to new business, the appointment of Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes. So. Um, as you know, we have been on many site visits, and we've had public forums and multiple interviews. And um, I am very excited to recommend to you uh, Mrs. Jennifer Parsons as the next assistant superintendent pending productive contract negotiations with her. Um, she would be coming to us from the Lincoln Street School in North Brow. And prior to that, she had been a principal here, and she just feels like uh, the right fit for us right now in terms of carrying on the work that we're doing, joining the um, administrative team, and um, working very closely with me. And the one thing that I will say is that in all of the time that we have spent interviewing, the one thing that has stood out for me about her is that she really keeps her focus on students. And mm -hmm. so it was it was a lovely thing to see. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Does anybody have questions or comments? Uh, just to comment the fact that um, Dr. Kavanaugh shared um, that you have considered so many aspects besides the fact that she's bringing so much of wealth with her, you considered how she would fit in with everybody, how she would complement some of the things that you bring to the table. So you looked at it from all those perspectives. And I think we also talked a little bit about some of the feedback that was received uh, from various members. So excellent, excellent choice. I did. I think it was a very good search. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to compliment you on the search. I think I was very impressed by all of the candidates. I really enjoyed um, the opportunity to go on the site visits. And I mean, I think they were all very strong candidates. So I'm sure it was a very difficult decision. Um, I think that it's an excellent decision. Um, and I, you know, I look forward to working with, with Mrs. Parson again, actually got to work with her before. So, um, so that's wonderful. But I do want to thank the other two candidates. They were very strong candidates. And I have no doubt that somebody's going to snap them up very quickly. Yes. So, um, so thank you for facilitating this whole process. And I think we are ready for a motion to accept the recommendation of Dr. Kavanaugh to appoint Jennifer Parson for the position of assistant superintendent, subject to an acceptable quarry background check and the successful completion of a mutually agreement Excuse me, mutually agreeable employment contract. So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so that was a motion by Mina, a second by Nancy, and that passes unanimously. And I also need a motion to authorize Dr. Kavanaugh <coughs> to enter into negotiations and execute it and execute a contract with Mrs. Parson based on the parameters provided by the school committee. So moved. <laughs> And a second? Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Great. So that's a motion by uh, Mina, a second by Nancy, and unanimous. So 
congratulations. Thank, thank you. you very I'm much. Thrilled. We look forward to signing that contract and getting to work. So yes, thanks. Wonderful. Um, okay, so the turf field bid that is our next item of business. Um, and oh, perfect timing. Um, Dan Terry from Parks and Rec is literally walking in the door as on we're cue. on cue. Um, we're just about to review the turf bid, um, Dan. So thank you for being here. Um, do you want to walk us through the bid? Sure. And the process and. Um, so we had um, uh, used Gale Associates to help us with um, all these process, the design and everything, to, and putting the documents together to go out to bid, um, both both for the general contract, um, but then in addition we also used a cooperative bid for the um, turf, the infill, and the, the shock pad. Um, the bids that came back, the low bid for the general contract was Green Acres in the amount of two million three hundred and thirty seven hundred and thirty seven. And the low quote for the cooperative bid was field turf in the amount of nine hundred and fourteen thousand nine hundred and ninety two. Um, these bids together now reduce our original estimate by over 361,000 um, of what we were originally projecting in our capital um, to the to the town. So the, the bids came in very favorable. And I also want to point out that um, even after the bids came in, that you and Kathy Hervel from Gale Associates went back to um, Field Turf and Shaw to even get them to reduce the price more um, in the in the co-op bid. Correct. So. Um, so we saved even more money there, and I just wanted to make sure that we noted that. Um, so does anybody have questions? So if I'm reading this correctly, this brings us b below what the amount that we've seen in the article, warrant article. Yes, so yeah. this this is below the placeholder amount that we've had by 300 and something yeah. thousand dollars. Does this impact how much CPC can give us, though? Because I, I know that there are certain things that are excluded. Is it still the same amount from them, or is it a different? Um, I don't think so. That is a good question. So they gave us $700,000 for the lights, which should still be um, in there. They are not able to pay for the carpet or the infill, so that price came down so that wouldn't be affected by what they're okay. able to do and they basically the rest of it was going to other project related costs so I don't Dan happens to also be on CPC but I don't think it would affect I think there's enough room in there for the other million um, yeah That was a good question, though. I didn't think of that. So that would reduce the amount that would need to be borrowed for this project. Yes. So that was $1.7 yeah. $1. million. And then the um, turf field subcommittee has committed to raising $500,000. So if you take all of that off, we're down at about $1.3 mm -hmm. million dollars that would actually have to be paid by the town. Um, so anything else? Good. Okay. And so, Susan, do we have to say in our motion that this is contingent on town meeting approval? So the bid itself actually what? outlines that it is contingent on town meeting approval. Okay. Um, the follow-up to your accepting of the bid is I will um, issue a letter that's called an intent to award. And in that letter, it says that it is contingent once again on town meeting. Okay. So we can just use this language here I believe for our so. motion. Okay. So um, do we need to say anything about the intent to award or we just accept the bid? We're oh. we're accepting we're accepting the bid. I mean you can we're expand accepting. it and say that we will issue an intent to award which outlines that it is contingent on town meeting approval. Okay. You Let's can do that, that just for transparency. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just writing just so that'll be part of our record that'll be um, okay so then I am ready for a motion to accept the bid 
from Green Acres and the quote from Field Turf for the Athletic Field Turf Project and to issue an intent to award which is contingent on approval at annual town meeting. So, um, oh, so you got it, Mina. You beat me by half a second. Okay, and but second. second it. <laughs> okay, very good. So motion by Mina, a second by Jen. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, since Mr. Terry is here, why don't we skip over new business C and we'll go right to the MOU between Parks and Rec and the school committee, if that's okay. Sure. Dan, do you want to join us? Um, so we have, I, I think I've given you an update about this before, but we've spent a great deal of time working with Dan and Jay Golfi from Parks and Rec with Amy Mick, who um, part, part is with youth soccer, who partners with them on the turf field, uh, excuse me, the Fruit Street fields, as well as with D King and Susan and Kathy and John Graziano and I. So we all work together to come up with this memorandum of understanding between the school committee and Parks and Rec, um, which really outlines how the turf fields, how the time will be allocated, how the maintenance will be taken care of, how the revenue will be generated, where the money will go, who has responsibility for oversight of all of that. So um, it, it's, I just have to say it's been a really collaborative process. I think it's gone really, really smoothly. I don't feel there's been any turf war over the turf. Um, and our goal from the outset was to, to complement what is existing at Fruit Street, not to compete with it, and to really expand the opportunities, not just for our high school athletes, but for the entire Hopkinson community, but as well as increase the um, attractiveness of Hopkinton as a place for outside groups to come and rent space because we now are expanding what we, you know, the footprint that we can offer to them. So I just think it's been a great um, process. And certainly if you guys have questions that we can answer about the MOU, that would be great. We'll vote on it. I don't know if you guys have already voted on it or we have you're not. going to. We will. So Parks and Rec will also vote on it. And then if the process, if the project is approved at town meeting, we'll be all set to collect money. So are there any questions? So much thought has gone into it right. with your name That's on funny. it. And I know John is also involved, so many people. We nailed it. She always has questions. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we did nail it. Well, and I think one of the best parts about it, it says, you know, if there's ever a need to clarify, further clarify roles, well, then we're going to do that. So, I mean, it's right. already built into the memorandum of understanding. So, yes. yeah, it's great. Yeah. Very good. good. Okay, wow. Um, so I just need a motion to approve the MOU between Parks and Rec and the school committee regarding the um, operation and management of the turf fields. So moved. Okay, and a second? Second. Um, so that's a motion by Jen, a second by Nancy. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So that's unanimous. That was pretty easy. Um, I hope it's right. that easy in your department meeting. It will be because we've Good. been... Um, We've been discussing it all along since I've been involved in the committee in general, and then as we got more involved with this MOU, um, we've been talking about it at every one of our meetings, and uh, Jay Golfi, our director, has been involved too. So um, any, any issues that have come up have been more just things that we needed to address and put into the document, more than, like Jean said, it, not, not a turf thing or anything yeah. like that. And I think that collaboration also helped um, CPC be more confident that this is a community asset and, and could make an investment in it. Good. Yeah, I agree. Anything else, Jean, that I can assist with in yes. parks and rec capacity? Yes. Yes, you can stay right there because what we will also do <laughs> Keep you in the hot seat. is um, skip ahead to Old Business B, where we are going to update the membership of the Athletic Field Subcommittee. Oh, that's right. And I, do you, you have that I have roster the list of for us? Thank you. Who is there now? Yes. So, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, we needed to obviously update the list because Dr. McLeod is not in the district full time anymore. Um, so we were going to add Susan as and, and replace, unfortunately, replace Kathy with Susan. But Susan's been great about coming to all of our meetings. Um, we do have one community member whose job um, requirements have changed, and he just isn't able to come to the meetings anymore. He's 
uh, he actually does this professionally, so he's still a really great resource that's accept accessible to us, but he's not able to come to the meetings. And then Dan has been a liaison since the beginning from Parks and Rec, but given the way that this has evolved and the joint management between Parks and Rec and the school committee, I really felt like he should have an actual vote at the table. I mean, we're down to the wire here, almost hopefully at the end of the project, but um, certainly wanted to recognize all of that participation and make sure that he has an official voice in, in what's going um, to happen going forward. So those are the changes that we were recommending. And we just, because we voted to set it up, I, we needed to vote to adjust it. So I don't know if there are any questions. No, this is fantastic. All right. How, Jean, how is it that the Parks and Rec is on? I don't, do I see it on here? Let me see. It just looks like the, is this the old one? This is the old one. one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. So you what's changing, if you look <laughs> at be. this, um, right, so Susan is not on this list, and you're not on this list. Oh, okay. So these are the ones. Make sure I spelled your name right. <laughs> Um, the only th thank you. The only thing I'd suggest, Jean, is just just for good form for Parks and Rec. I, I'd just as soon have a Parks and Rec member be a voting member. Okay. Uh, and and then we'll appoint someone next week. I'm I'm pretty sure I'll be appointed. But. Okay. So I'm going to reflect that in the motion that we okay. make right now. But okay. that's a great suggestion. Okay. See how we work well together. Um, all right, where's my, oh, here it is. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to approve the following changes to the athletic field subcommittee. Remove Kathy McLeod as superintendent. Appoint Susan Rothermick as director of finance and operations. Change the Parks and Rec member from a non-voting member liaison to a voting member role. And remove Ed LaFleur as a community member. So moved. Okay, and a second? A second. Um, so a motion by Mina, a second by Jen. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody opposed? So that is unanimous. We're all set. All right. That was pretty efficient. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. You too. Thank you. <laughs> now we just have to get it to pass a town meeting. Yeah. No, no small hurdle. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. So next up is... Um, Master plan. The master, yeah, so we'll go back. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> so we'll go back to the campus master plan, stage one. Okay, uh, thank you. So as you know, we have engaged World Tech Engineering to perform um, a study of the campus, middle school, high school, and Hopkins. And this really is a follow-on to the traffic calming on Hayden Row as well. Um, so what they're looking at is to put together the, f the full vision of parking, um, traffic flow, um, with the additional guidance of designating a school bus parking lot and also a um, building for grounds to house the, the grounds equipment. So those are the important aspects. So at this point, on the uh, town um, Warren article. We do have a an article on there for the stage one. Back in in beginning, we didn't know what stage one would be, but stage one now has fallen out to be a school bus parking lot. Um, so what we need to do to continue to move forward, the hope would be this passes town meeting in the spring, is to actually construct and build that bus parking lot over the summer. Um, so as you can imagine, the deadlines are, are pretty tight. In order to try to move that forward, what we need to do is go to conservation. So we need to look at all the wetlands delineation, all the permitting process that would have to happen to construct that parking lot, and actually put together that design document to construct that parking lot. Um, so this memo is really looking for the funding using the school bus revolving account um, to pay for those pieces that we would need to move forward to really hit the ground if this passes town meeting. Any questions? Just a question about stage one with the bus parking lot, if it goes behind, I forget what field number it is, but would that also necessitate widening of the roadway that goes between the middle and the high school? So let's go make it down there. The, the buses would come down and pull in behind the high school 
Okay, come down the loop road. Down there. the loop oh, road. They wouldn't go down that. They other. would not. Okay. Um, so the there would not be any travel between the middle school okay. and high school. So they would come in behind the high school, loop into Field Nine, which would become the parking lot. Right. Loop in. They would be parked there. They'd be staged there for the kids to all Get load. On. Yep. Um, and then it there would be another loop, and they would exit back out okay. the way they came in. That makes sense. So, it, but this is also the parking lot. So this is where the buses will park overnight. That's correct. So is there also room, like where, this is a silly question maybe, but where do the bus driver's cars go? So the lot actually is big enough to accommodate, the plan for the lot is actually big okay. enough to accommodate 30 buses. Uh -huh. And the driver's cars. Nice. Okay. Because okay. I was afraid they were going to go. Back. That was always the caveat that we Good. not only needed to find a place to park the buses, but we needed a place for the driver's cars okay. as well. Okay. So yes. No, go ahead. It's okay. Um, you know, it's been a while since we went through this. So you talked about the traffic calming measures, and this is, uh, you know, the reason the driver for this is the traffic on um, you know as parents are trying to get into high school can you speak a little bit just refresh uh, my memory if you don't mind um, so I don't have all the history because it's before my time um, but basically the the traffic calming is really to get cars off of Hayden Row that are sitting there waiting to pull into the campus either to drop their students off or pick up their students. So there's a couple of conflicts. You In the front of the building, you have all the students being dropped off, picked up, and buses. So as much as possible, you always want to separate bus and, and vehicle traffic. So this is the first step in, in separating that bus and, and vehicle traffic. It creates more room in the front for parents to be able to come in, pick up, drop off their, their student. Just separating that bus from that part of the queue will be helpful. I see, but with regard to the parents drop off and pick up, the current method that has been put in place, as this first phase gets implemented, that will continue? But we will no longer have buses in the bus right. parking lot, right. so now that opens up more space. I see, I see, so, so it's purely focused on separating the two. Correct, and so it's, and that's why I say it's, it's stage one. So this is the first step of a, of a longer vision. Sure. But it also, the other advantage is that there has been a push for several years now to bus the, to not bus, to house the buses in Hopkinton so that we collect the excise taxes, where right now they're being housed in Ashland. Ashland collects all the excise taxes on 27 buses, mm -hmm. which amounts to like $50,000 a year, so that we would make the money back just by having them here. Right. I mean, we, the town, the money the would town go to the well. town, not to us. In the associated capital article that we have, um, how much to what amount is that? Is it 320000 So currently the amount is 320000 um, We had a discussion actually with Mr. Kamalo yesterday of increasing that to 400000 um, with the thought process that we just really want to make sure that we would be able to address any conservation um, uh, order of conditions that would be part of this parking lot. And because we have not gone to conservation yet, we just want to make sure that that article is enough that would be sufficient. And of course, once we have all the, you know, the actual documents, um, the town would only borrow what the, what the actual cost is, so. And um, so this proposed, uh, you know, the study, since this item is, you know, up for election, you know, for the voters to decide in case, let's hope it goes through, but just in case it doesn't, would this amount that has been put towards the study, would it still be reusable? That's correct. So the wetland delineation and all, and all of that, um, all the permitting um, would stay because that doesn't change and the actual design document for the parking lot would stay because again, that doesn't change. So it, it can be something that can be carried forward and go out to, uh, to another town meeting if it, if it doesn't pass. Um, so it's not lost. 
see that that's good to know and just a couple more questions whenever we have a master plan and it gets split into phase one and phase two uh, somehow i feel like you know the bigger picture while you know you have to break it out that must be clear right we can't build the first piece and then wonder about the second piece. And I'm just wondering if you can share some details around that, some, if some thought has gone in, and you know, uh, if you can share some details there. Yes, I mean, this is, the, the, this is part of what will be the whole plan. Um, so the, the um, uh, design firm is in the process of putting together what that full plan will look like. You know, they're putting together um, some CAD drawings, okay. and first that will be presented to the administration. I see. Okay. And I think we're hoping to present it to the school committee at, at, at our next meeting. Okay. That, that's but I, as I understand it, we need to move forward more quickly on the study for the bus parking lot so that we can be ready if it is approved to not lose time and, and get it done so over the summer. Even now, it's March 15th, you probably would be at a press to get on the first April CONCOM meeting. It probably would be the end of April. Uh, so y you see how quickly the, the time goes by. Yeah. And the design documents would have to be based on any order of conditions that come out of that. So you're already looking at design documents being pushed into May. Um, so that's why the expediency of, of moving this along to be able to construct in the summer right. is, is very important. One last, I mm -hmm. promise, the final question. Um, as you're conducting, uh, this uh, company um, is conducting its study, would it be speaking with uh, the community members, parents who use that space, or even bus drivers, for instance, would they be part of the thought process of, of the solution? So every... Um, uh, option that they have brought forward has been discussed with the SRO, so Phil has been involved, um, the Director of Grounds has been involved, I have been involved, um, the administration has been involved. And this is an engineering study. It's engineering. Yeah, correct. Right, and, and I don't mean to say that we need, uh, you know, the, the town people to speak to the engineering aspects of it, but more from a space usage and, you know, as Hopkins parents are going in there, the buses would be using that space. So just coming from that perspective, that should someone from the community also be engaged while, you know, all of this is thought through people who are using that space. That's that's all I'm, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, like I said, we'll be presenting to the administration the, the um, options, and then we would be presenting to the school committee <coughs> in the future. Okay. And, and I mean, ultimately, that's what people get to vote on a town meeting, if they, they like it or they don't. I will just say that this is a response that we have had to make because of the traffic coming, which, you know, it wasn't a problem that we created, <laughs> that we're that we've inherited to solve, and so I think that a lot of time and thought has gone into this. And um, you know, as you pointed out, none of this work is going to be lost if it doesn't move forward this year. But this is these are how we're going to answer some of these questions: is getting this study done, and then we'll have more to look at and chew on at our next meeting. Right. Um, and Jean, where I'm coming from is. I don't have kids in Hopkins or at the high school, so I am so unfamiliar that while I can vote and I can reach out to my friends and you know other community members to hear their thoughts, I just felt you know I, I'm sure you all are here who uh, who probably have first-hand experience of it. So, yeah. any other questions? No. Well, all right. So I. I think we are ready for a motion to approve $40,000 from the school bus revolving account to fund the design and permitting of the school bus parking lot. So moved. In a second. Second. A motion by Nancy, second by Jen. All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? Okay, so that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, and now we will skip over. We just did that one. Uh, so we're now down to school committee policy KF, community use of school facilities. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, are you walking us through this? Or <laughs> um, 
I didn't think so. All right. So I am. haven't been doing policy. Right. So. Okay. okay. So this one we put on, well, in um, Jen. Jen and and um, Nancy really are our policy people with Dr. McLeod. But this one we put on there specifically because um, as we were drafting the MOU with Parks and Rec regarding the turf fields, we, went, we took a look at our field use policy, our facilities use policy, and wanted to make sure that those two documents were not in conflict with each other. So that was the reason why we opened the policy. But then, of course, once the policy is open, the policy is open. Um, so do you guys want to talk about um, I, I was actually not at the meeting where this policy was discussed, so. Sure. And I mean, Jean, you just basically summarized yeah. the purpose. I mean, we wanted to in, um, make sure that there was a distinction made between um, use of the grass fields and use of the turf fields. Um, and then, like you said, we reviewed the rest of the wording and, and made sure that we felt like it was still in um, appropriate for where we are right now. So that was really the, the main driver behind reviewing this policy is including the word grass mm -hmm. before the word fields and then adding in that um, additional paragraph concerning the turf fields. Um, one thing that I did notice as I was reading through it for this meeting is um, one, two, three, fourth paragraph down. For some reason, supervision, the word supervision seems to be... Um, oh, yes. Um, is it, yeah, it, yeah, I don't know if it's a hyperlink or, or what it is, but I think it might just be a... Um, um, just need to be corrected to regular text, it looks like. Okay. But other than, that's the only thing that I see on here that's... And in the red font, are um, you seeing an extra between? Oh, Third where's... paragraph. You see an extra between? An agreement between has been formed between. Ah. Oh. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Good call. We'll fix that one. Thank you. Yep. I have a couple of... Yeah. Okay. Yes, I don't. Um, so I think that from a policy standpoint, one of the things I've really liked this year with the work that you all have done is separating the procedure from the policy. And I was wondering, um, you know, and in light of um, one of the requests that we received, um, if we would consider the list of organizations to mm -hmm. be managed separately so rather than making it part of the policy. Oh, that might that might make sense. Yes. So thank you. So we did. That was one of the public comment um, emails that we received about this policy. There was a request to add an additional um, um, special affiliation group um, under category one. Um, so you're suggesting we take that out of the policy and add it in the procedures? Right, and you know, manage that separately because the policy is trying to say, okay, if you are uh, affiliated specially, this is how we proceed. Mm -hmm. But which all are the organizations that we define are affiliated? And I don't know what the definition of that is. Mm -hmm. What is the category, you know, what is the criteria for it? Mm -hmm. But I feel like if we manage that separately, we wouldn't have to change the policy. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, good question. if good point. another organization comes in and says, you know, we are affiliated with the schools as well, then we don't have to touch the policy. And maybe that's something we look at separately. They come present to the school committee and we can take a vote because the way it's worded is that the school committee decides and votes whether they are affiliated or not. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, I think that's a good suggestion, Nina. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it, the request that we got in particular, um, I was struggling with a little bit. It's a great organization, or a great group that, you know, does very good work, but it's like I, I'm wondering if we have it in the policy here if it implies that or legislates that these groups do get access to the buildings and I know in particular this one organization um, isn't able to complete the requirement for insurance for example that you are required to complete when you fill out your facilities use um, application and so I mean I don't I just wouldn't want to do anything that would override obviously that legal requirement um, so I think your suggestion is a good one. If we move it out of the policy and into the procedure, that allows more flexibility over time, and that could be reviewed, you know, by the superintendent and the director of buildings and grounds. 
separately at any time. Right, and whatever that criteria may be um, to determine the affiliation, and if there are other things, like you talked about insurance, and are there any instances where we would be okay uh, with not having insurance? I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. But we don't have to include that in the policy. Remember the talk about That's the legal idea. bills? Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and say no but, on that. <laughs> so the insurance is a separate issue, because if you look at the list here, I don't believe all the list, the organizations that are listed carry the liability insurance that's required in the well in they order have to pair up with somebody in order to actually have an event that's right but it but, that but who, somebody yeah. on the application yes. has and to have but insurance so right? i don't i'm well, not opposed to, i'm not opposed to taking the list and putting it in policy but i don't think in looking at this list that not having the insurance is an automatic okay. disqualifier. All right, well, that makes me feel better, too. Even though I know they need insurance to have a, an right. event here. Yeah. Right. That, the insurance that is non-negotiable. It's, it's in separate. the separate That's document. That's in the application. It's in a totally right. separate document. Right. right. But I think it is, it is a good idea because then um, I honestly don't know who manages the list of affiliated um, programs and ones that are categorized as one, two, three, four. But that's a good question to find the answer to. And then um, it would be, it would be, we wouldn't need to vote every time someone right. who, you know, it, it would be separate, mm -hmm. I think, which is a good idea. Because I think it, it, my take on it, in all honesty, is that it's, it's good to be inclusive of more groups than fewer, but there needs to be criteria. Right. That the groups have something that actually is affiliated with the school. I mean, I think if you look at some of the things that were listed, you could make for the HDTC, they, they could make some school-related programs that they've done, but there are other organizations that probably could as well. And I think that's an argument for pulling it out of the policy that's and putting right. it into something separate. Right, and, and I mean... And then establishing guidelines for what... It, so that it's not just an arbitrary decision going forward. Right, exactly. and at any time, new groups can form. Well, exactly. So, it, so yeah. we don't need... Uh, open. Changing a policy is always more cumbersome than changing exactly. the procedure, which is why we've exactly. made an effort to be more flexible about that. So I think that's a great suggestion. I, I think my request then would be, um, do you guys want to take this back into the um, policy subgroup? I know, you know, I would love to let um, Susan and Kath and um, Carol think about this a little bit, as well as talk to Dr. McLeod and make sure there's not right. some sure. thing that we're overlooking. But I think, um, you know, we could make those changes and bring it back at our next meeting. The only other thing that I would suggest is that we also, having just voted it, um, include the MR, MOU on the turf fi fields in the policy cross-reference okay. so As that people are clear about who they ask. Yep. I, I just, I want to make sure that this third paragraph is clear, is as clear as can be that if you want to use the turf fields, you contact the oversight committee, not the school district. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe even just adding on to that last sentence, you know, um, who is responsible, for, you know, comma, who is responsible for scheduling the fields or something like that. Because really, if, you know, the only part that we manage is the part during the school day. Yep. So anybody outside of that, outside of a high school or middle school athletic team is going through Parks and Rec. That's a good point. We may be able to eliminate all of these categories from the policy itself and have them be their own separate document, and then that can... Well, that's true. They are all in the procedure. Procedure. Yeah. So, policy. yeah, we may be even just be able to cut them completely as part of the policy, keep them, but move them to a different document. Yeah. Okay. And, Jen, as, you know, as you're all looking to define some of the criteria, if you will, I want to second what Nancy was saying about being as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if there is an organization that's non-revenue generating and is doing something for the schools, I understand the legal aspects and the liabilities, but as, as much as possible. To be community partners Absolutely. with them. If they're Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's very important. I, I can see, I know that, for instance, Destination Imagination is one such organization that um, runs an info night once a year. And they have to, um, you know, uh, 
rent a place outside and I know the fees are so low everyone's a volunteer they're doing it for kids so organizations like that and I'm sure there are a lot more but at the same time don't want to introduce any liabilities here but be inclusive to the extent possible mm. the one thing I, I do think that is challenging for organizations and I'm gonna guess DI is one but I'm not I don't know enough about it to know but is that everybody has to pay the custodial fees mm -hmm. which are forty dollars an hour and with a minimum of four hours so that that regardless of whether or not they have to pay a rental fee sure sure right and, and that was a source of yeah. I think um, concern if not confusion in the email that we did get and so so regardless of what category you in, you're in, it does not exempt you from the custodial okay, fees. Right, so right. for example, and in particular on a day when the building is otherwise closed, obviously the custodians that are asked to work on a holiday need to be compensated. And um, apropos of our earlier discussion about our budget deficit, we, we do can't not, fund other groups. We, we can't yeah, do that. We have a tremendous amount of use of these buildings and so we yeah. can't take on that cost. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay, I think that was, that sounds good. So you guys will make those yep. revisions we'll, we'll and bring those that, back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so moving on to school committee policy, ADDA criminal record information. Um, Jen, do you want it? Sure. Um, so in reviewing this policy, one of the things that um, I guess two things. First is that um, there was uh, a question from the public concerning um, why they needed to be Cori checked in order to be in the building because they weren't having unsupervised contact with children while they were volunteering in the building, um, which is a good question. Um, but I think that th there are so many possible scenarios where um, that person is walking from the office to the classrooms. They're alone in the building, um, potentially right, running into children in an unsupervised situation. Um, so we wanted to adjust the wording a little bit to reflect um, a broader group of, of folks who um, come into the building. So um, you can, I don't have to read through all of the, the red lines here, but you know we don't use taxi cab drivers in our district to transport students, so we removed that. Um, we um, added this final sentence um, basically to summarize the purpose of it because we you could have potential for direct and unmonitored contact. It's mm -hmm. not that you will, but there's potential for it if you come into the school as a volunteer, and we just want to ensure the safety of our students. Um, the um, if you scroll down to um, section A, um, we needed to include that it's for adults, so it's anyone who's 18 years or older. Um, and then um, the definitions themselves weren't relevant to the policy. Not that it, they're not relevant, but to the policy itself, we felt like that was not something that needed to be a part of it. Um, so we eliminated quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of the weight in this policy, but it's because those pieces weren't relevant to policy itself. Um, and then that was about it, I guess. Yep, that was it. So um, I have one question about this: um, 18 years of age or older. Why is that legally considered an adult? Is that the only time that you would do a Cori check? What if there is a 17-year-old? That's okay. I don't I, think just, a Cori check asking. would pull up offenses on a 17-year-old. On a 17-year-old, like right. it's, it's part of the law. Yeah, is their records right? would be sealed, right? Yeah. If they're younger than 18. Okay. okay. And would some of these things that you have taken off will they be going into some kind of a procedure book or a handbook or something like that at all? I don't know the answer to that question. I just know we were taking them out of the policy. <laughs> but that's a good question. I think um, I could check on that for you. But I feel like um, we wanted to try to make the policy less prohibitive to understand. And a lot of it was, um, you know, Cori checks will be completed and reviewed prior to commencement of employee or volunteer services every three. There was such a, um, a lot of words that were basically saying we're going to conduct Cori checks for any adult who w may have the potential for um, 
contact, unsupervised contact with a student. I see. And, and employees, I should say. It's not just volunteers, but any, any adult who comes into the school um, who has the potential for contact with students. And it's clear that this doesn't apply to our students, right? Because we do have students who are 18, 18 years yes. and older, up to 22. Right, but they, right, they're so registered as long as they're a students. student, yeah, that's exactly. okay. Um, I had a couple editor, you know, like editing things, which I yeah, will I noticed a couple drag things. you Go all ahead. through. Well, you're good with those. I, there, we've we've like gone back and forth between insure, ensure, and usher, so I think we need to pick one. <laughs> I think it's ensure. Right? Insure, Where do you see it? Should be insure. It, it's the last, the first here in the first oh, paragraph sorry. in the first oh, okay. highlighted. So I think that should be ensure. Okay. And then it's um, in the also in the first sentence of the third parties paragraph. Okay. So policy. Um. Good. Um. Also in the first paragraph, okay. This first sentence that you've struck out, you just you went one word too far. Yes. To take out four. Four. Yep. yep. And then under A, I think the, in the first sentence it should be who have the potential, not whom. Um, and then. Why did I write this down? I, I wanted to make sure that this also covers our extracurricular providers as well as enrichment um, providers that come in during the school day. I think it does, just double checking. So during the school day? That, that would be for sure covered. Right, exactly. And then um, third parties in, I guess we took the letter E out in this because we stopped using the letters to organize the document, but um, it, where it says third parties, um, <laughs> assure, ensure, we'll have to look at that one too, mm -hmm. but um, all contracts with private or out of district special education, oh, I'm sorry, that's not it. There's, there's a section further down. Um, in other circumstances, work study programs, internships, um, pretty after school hours for extracurricular. Um, I have to. I'll have to double check this, but I think that part of our conversation involved, you know, this this policy is for um, folks who are with our students during school hours, mm -hmm. and then if someone wants to run something at the school after school hours, that organization is responsible for conducting their own quarry checks. Yeah, and. Um, is that your question? Well, a little bit, although I will say, you know, back in the day when I was in the PTA, the PTA didn't have an independent ability to quarry check, but we absolutely were, oh, yeah. were required, the district quarry checked all of our extracurricular okay. um, providers because, especially because they were in that category where we're not charging them rent, right. you know. Right. Pay, um, so. You know, okay. I'll put that just down as, as an question. extra, yeah, I would just double okay. check that one thing. Okay. Um. I had one. Or, or do you have one? Nope. I had one thing where it says taxi cab drivers. Should there also be um, instead of taxi ca cab drivers, van drivers because the except drives vans frequently. Or should we just say drivers? Drivers and drivers. 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 Okay. So get. Is that a get rid of class? Yeah. But are yes. those typically done by? you know, their parent organizations, how does that work, or do we do it too? The bus company does it. Right, yep. okay. And um, Jen, I've been trying to find about the minors, Cody, I don't see anything that says it can't be checked on the minors, so um, I can probably look and get back to you if you would like. Sure, we can find out, yeah. On the Cody, um, because I, I, you know, not that we would necessarily have that, but I don't, you know, I, I think that's relevant too. Well, I'm pretty sure outside. if you're a minor and you have a criminal record, it's sealed. But you mean, yeah, you're certainly welcome to check. Okay. But mm. um, All right. What I'm seeing is more a consent from a guardian of a minor to release their quarry. It's, it's a form that I saw in one of the sites. 
but but again i can take that offline if you would like or if you think you have all done that research then to release their i'm just point of clarification to release their quarry that the schools are conducting their own, our own right quarry but, checks. but the parents have to be okay the legal guardian of a minor has to be okay give the consent okay i see what you're saying if we went to doing that's right and to minors. me that implies right. that quarries can be done on someone under 18 but again it's not clear just based on this quick search yeah i don't know the answer to that question <clears throat> all i'm saying is where we are changing the wording to what it has been before we make that change just a check that's all okay i'll find out and would there be a situation where we would have somebody under the age of 18 that would be coming into the schools who wasn't a student? Only a small child that I, I could only think of small children. Well, unless like the example of we hosted a, a year ago, I think Ashland was supposed to have those students oh, right. with them and they came, they were from China or someplace. Mm -hmm. They were only here for a week and they came around with, to our high school, they would have been under 18 and a, mm -hmm. not Corey check, but all right, well, so, so you guys we need to put more thought and research. Back to your, okay. your think tank okay. and get back to us. Try. I hope we got it all down here. Yeah. All right, any other questions about that one? We're ready to move on to um, school committee policy ADA. And I do want to preface this by saying I received a couple of emails um, this afternoon from people who wanted to um, have, the, who had just, you know, read the listserv and wanted to have the opportunity to weigh in but hadn't had a chance really to fully process this. So I don't think we're necessarily inclined to vote on this tonight, but I just would like to make sure that we, I, I specifically wanted to acknowledge that there are a couple of people who have asked for extra time um, to review this and send us feedback. So. Um, I, I won't be looking for a motion to take any action on this. It's a first reading, and we typically don't anyway, but I just want to make that clear up front. Um, and once I realized that this was not a policy about ADA, <laughs> that was actually the code, it's, things started to make a little bit more sense to me. But um, so, uh, Go ahead. I'll let you introduce it first because I don't want to add a question. Well, and that, that was the, you know, Nancy and I were briefly mentioning how ADA stands for something that, is extraordinarily important to lots exactly. of folks, and so right. may have struck a chord with them. Um, but it's just the the you know alphabet soup that is used to right. categorize all of the policies, as I'm learning. Um, so at the very beginning of the year, when we read through all of the policies, this one kind of stuck out as um, not being a policy. Right. It's a philosophy and a very good one, but it isn't something that is policy. So um, the question is whether or not we remove it from our list of policies and, you know, we can still maintain it as a philosophy. It can be on the website as, as our, you know, school committee's philosophy, but it's not policy. Well, and I also, when I read it too, I, I was thinking, you know, since 1993, um, we've had a series of strategic plans which may not have been in place at the time that this was written either, and I think that that really outlines uh, you know our vision maybe not specifically our policy but as we are wrapping up the final year of our strategic plan and looking forward you know spoiler alert to dr kavanaugh um, <laughs> working on our next version of the strategic plan i think you know um, it would also be great to consider some of this <coughs> mm -hmm. including some of that or including if i don't know if we have a statement of philosophy at the beginning of our strategic plan. It's been a while since I looked at it, but that might be a better place for it. I think a more accessible place for it than on a list of policies that I don't think people frequently access. But so that's just another thing to consider as we're um, deciding what to do about this one. Okay. So regardless of what we what end up doing with it, I would recommend that we change the coding on it from ADA to something else. Mm -hmm. that we can still keep it within the way that MASC does it, but like ADAA or something right. that would be. I looked on the MASC website and I could not find right. a policy ADA. Doesn't yeah. mean it's yeah. not there, but I couldn't no, find it, it. So I don't. It's so yeah. old. Yes. It's so yeah. old. <laughs> right. It, it may just be. And they maybe realize that ADA is right. not a maybe good we should title change the for name. this. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. 
because it confused me. I went I, through it with the lens. The lens I had when I was reading it was thinking it was ADA. Well, right. and I also thought, that's a federal law. Like, why do we need, what would the policy say besides, of course? <laughs> right, right. You know, so well, I right. really, beyond And right. then when I read this, I was yeah. like, oh, wait a second. That's not really what that is. And very likely the folks who needed time to digest it were worried that it had something to do with the law. Yes. And so, you right. know. So yeah, we do so. respect the law. Just well, and not even, it's not just the law, but in looking at philosophy of how we're educating sure. our, our needier or, or disabled students yeah. mm -hmm. and making sure that we're not leaving them with just kind of bare bones. Right. 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 All right. So we will uh, certainly welcome more um, feedback from people in the public who are, are looking at this and who are wanting to weigh in, absolutely. But I think you sort of have a sense of where we are in um, terms of bringing it back um, for a recommendation maybe at the next meeting. So for now, just table this one, you think? If, I think so. I, okay. I certainly want to, you know, to give people t time to weigh in as they've requested. That's certainly reasonable. And I also I think we could think about whether this is something that might more appropriately be included in our next strategic plan. Um, or maybe we'll find. So there wasn't a policy ADA on the MASC website, but was there anything that was like educational philosophy that had a different code? There was. Um, I can pull it up for you. I can't remember the details of it, but it was um, a very short four sentences, it wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't as in-depth as this document. So if we do keep it, we could switch whatever that code is. Maybe we right. could we at least There's, change the code, right. and that would be a little bit yeah. less confusing. Probably at least to a, me. It should be an A code, but yes. <laughs> it, it is. Yes, yes, it was an A code. Yes. Yeah. All right. So are we ready to move on to Just this? one question on this. Um, so the other one that you're talking about, is it more like guiding principles for the school committee? Is that... I, don't, no, I honestly it's more don't the remember. Educational. Oh, you mean the one she was looking at? Oh, sorry, I thought you meant this no, one. No, it's okay. Um, well, maybe we can have that in our packet next time. Mm. Oh. Yeah, I can look. I can look it up for you and tell you when next time when it does. not if you're Thank interested. You so much. You feel cool that you've learned all this. I know. The way <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're giving you a lot of homework. Just saying. <laughs> I'm on the second page, do we all right. Meet, do we meet again? <laughs> we don't meet again That's until good. after the next. Yeah, I think it's we don't it's have the one first this month. Yeah. first of the month. Yep. Yeah. You give yourself all the time you need. <laughs> um, okay. But I'll look. So are we ready to move on? All right. So next is the student activities account. Um, is this Susan or here? This is Susan. Is she. Okay. Yep. So um, back in 2016, the, the um, effort, what you had at the time was a fundraising account that all teams that were doing fundraising um, and adults or anything was being put into a revolving account. So that revolving account was acting very much like um, the gift accounts that are at all the various schools. Uh, the thought process at the time was to transfer the money from that revolving account into student activities, really with the thought that it would be easier and faster to pay for things that were being requested um, by the teams. The difficulty is when once you put something into student activities, there are very strict laws around what you can spend the money on. And as a, for instance, the fundraising activities were being used to pay for things such as coaching software or for coaches to go to professional development, um, you know, coaching trainings. Um, once it's in student activities, you can no longer use the funds for those types of spending. Um, so it, it, it's very strict. So the discussion um, began with Ms. King, uh, the athletic director, in really trying to get back to the sense of really what they were fundraising for. Um, and it was for all aspects around the team and what they, what they wanted to do. So the thought process would be to transfer the money to the athletic boosters. That's a function that they perform now. Um, so Ms. King is very much involved with the boosters. 
brings forward team requests that that the boosters would would then fund so it makes sense for the money that is sitting in student activities which right now is very restricted in terms of use to go to the athletic boosters that really was the intent of the fundraising for for the them to be able to access that for what the teams wanted above and beyond so is there I, so how will it work like for example you know um, the soccer team runs a summer camp and they raise money and then they use that to buy you know shirts or gear for themselves for the year so how is there like is their money going to be separately tracked and accounted for so that they know that you know the boosters so know <laughs> they're capped at this and they're not getting so I think um, you know D is going to work with the boosters in terms of exactly what the rules will be if you will um, so it, she will be the one that funnels okay. the team requests to the boosters so teams can't go directly to the boosters okay everything has to go through the athletic director okay okay any questions that's all money that's been fundraised it's not tax money being moved in this no it okay. is not tax money that's these are this is all fundraising about. efforts that have happened over a number of years by multiple and they, teams and i know they do a lot of fundraising correct and sorry, I didn't, oh, so you, were you done? Yeah, Go ahead, I'm, I'm sorry. Done. No, I'm I should have thought of this question beforehand, but it just came to me. So as you were speaking, um, the athletic boosters' accounts are not housed as within the school's accounts, or they are? No, they, they are, are not. not. They're, they're their own separate. So they, um, through our athletic director, would sort of have final decision of how to use that money? Are we losing control of that, do you think? Or, I mean, no, because I mean the the athletic director really, the the boosters, somewhat an, they answer to the athletic director. Okay, all right. Yeah. And I, I know that their intention is to support the teams. I, I totally understand that. But right. I just right. you know I wasn't sure if it was, we were sort of losing our ability to use it. No, I mean like I said that okay. the athletic director is is directly involved okay. with the boosters and and that's their function sure is right. to, to support team requests okay perfect thank you and now that we're talking about it one question and I don't know if you have that answer really how what is the what are the funds like in this account right now so there's about sixty five thousand dollars in there which is like I said a function of about 24 different teams that have raised money over the years. Great. Awesome. Good. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So I just need a motion to approve closing out the high school student activities account slash athletic clubs fundraising and move all funds to the athletic Hopkinton Athletic Booster Club. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay. So motion by Jen, a second by Nancy. All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? Okay. So that's unanimous. And now we are on to the budget transfer. This is like this. This is your meeting, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so the budget transfer really is. Um, just a follow-on to the budget, the financial report that I gave in the beginning of the meeting. Um, for the accounts, as I said, each department has been going through and identifying places where they're coming in under budget and are looking to move money to cover places where we have gone um, over budget. So this really cleans up some of these deficit accounts. It makes it much clearer for each department to run their accounts and see truly what the balances are that are left at that point in time. Any questions? Okay. So we, but we need to approve them. So I just need a motion to approve the budget transfers as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. And a second? A second. Okay. All in favor? Yes. 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 So that was a motion by Jen. I mean, sorry, by Mina. A second by Jen. And that was anyone opposed? So that was no. unanimous. I didn't do that in a very coherent order. <laughs> um, but we got through it. Okay. 
So, um, the Elmwood SOI, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, here we go. So I have some handouts that come to you really from Dr. McLeod. Thank you. So what she would like to do is to be able to submit our statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA. And if we are able to do this, um, all it tells the MSBA is that we have an interest in being considered. It doesn't cost us any money. Um, if we are invited into that eligibility period, we do have 270 days to complete that first phase. So right now we are just kind of hoping that we can get something on the table with the MSBA. And if we are able to do that, it gets us to a place where we can start to think about sort of the structure of Elmwood, the number of kids that we have there. Our predictions are that we will have many more little bodies in that building very soon. Um, and, you know, as we know, the, the building is... Um, a little bit dated. So we do need approval from the school committee and from the Board of Selectmen. And the other thing that we need to submit are approved minutes mm -hmm. from our meetings before April 8th. So Okay. Very good. So that's just a heads up for um, for you, Mina, that we should get the minutes of this meeting in the, mater in the packet for March 29th so we can approve them. Yes. Um, okay, I'll send a note to Sue. So yeah, that would be great. Yep. Um, and we, so first we'll open up, up for questions, but I just want to also point out while we're talking about the minutes, this text that we're going to read, you have right here in your packet, that's exactly what has to be in the minutes too. Okay. Okay, um, okay any questions? I have questions. <laughs> um, so... When we look at this, uh, you know, the, the handout that has been shared, is there any timeline that you're able to share around this? So right now we are just in the incipient stages. We send this into the MSBA, and if we get invited into eligibility, and there's no guarantee that we will, um, you have 270 days, and there's even some flexibility because they would want us to have approved this in the um, town meeting of 2019 before you would ever start to go forward, right? So it does give you more than a year's time right now. I see, I see. Okay. And there is no question at this moment of the feasibility study coming into play, is there? We are simply submitting a statement of interest. Yes. Okay. It would only be after, you know, if we get invited, that's when the feasibility study and all of that would kick in. Mm -hmm. And when, when we look at this preparation, scope definition, and scope monitoring, where are we right now? See all the way up here in this corner over here, not part of any of those timelines. This right that's here. Right. Summit? This is, that's where we are. Summit. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we're not in any of those. Right? Correct. Yes, we are in that little blue box right at the top right now. Great. We've been in that blue box um, how many times? times? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've submitted, this is our fourth, fifth. I don't remember how many submissions. I, I actually went on to the MSBA website. I believe we submitted the statement of interest for this and center at the same time. Oh. We did that several times. Um, because we definitely submitted for, uh, before you had to pick, uh, you could submit as many statements of interest as you wanted, and then you could pick a priority yeah, project. So for a couple times, we submitted center in Elmwood. And then when we mm -hmm. submitted center the last time that we were accepted, we also accept we also submitted Elmwood because it was possible that that was going to be one of the solutions to look at, was to combine the two schools and do one solution on the Elmwood site, which obviously didn't go forward. And then we submitted another one last year. So I, it's got to be, this has got to be our fourth, if not our fifth, um, so, you know, hopefully someday soon, but I'm I don't think come. there's a danger that we're going to have to come up with the feasibility study money in the next 30 days, oh, 90 no. days. So other than the obvious benefits that we might get picked and might get to go forward with this um, before we're actually overcrowded, by if we chose not to do this this year, would that then put us at a disadvantage next year because we were not in line consecutively for all those years? I don't know if that's a I actually thing. don't know the answer to that. I think one of the things that 
Dr. McLeod has said to me is that if there is sort of an off year where you don't submit your SOI, it does make the MSBA think that you're not, not a critical important. need or not, right. yeah, that you're right. less so interested. So it's, it's important even if we're not going to get picked to stay in line. Yes. It's like Good when point. you're in a long line yeah. waiting for something and you get out and somebody yes. takes your spot. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hmm. okay. Right. I mean, with all, all that has that has been happening in town, uh, yeah. Expecting lots of bodies to show up. Okay. Anything else? No. Maybe you can be on another building committee, Jen. Like a oh, you're a pro. <laughs> Professional building committee. And person. we had gotten, um, you know, we had spoken about this. Uh, well, Dr. McLeod had mentioned it at the Board of Selectmen joint meeting, also, yes. right? Was a more like a verbal uh, support from because, them, right? Right, because I think she didn't want to put the effort into it if they were not going to endorse it, if they already knew they were against it. Because they, That's in order for us to submit it, the Board of Selectmen has to vote on it. Thank you. And we will need their minutes as well. We'll assign Megan that. Yes. She's good at keeping She's on, on top of them. <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. So then I think we are ready for a motion, and I will read it. Um, resolved, having convened in an open meeting on March fifteenth, two 2018, prior to the closing date, the School Committee of Hopkinton, Mass., in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form dated March 29th, 2018 for the Elmwood School located at 14 Elm Street, Hopkinton, Mass., 01748, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future for one, priority number four, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments. And two, priority number five, replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility. And hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the, award, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Mass Massachusetts School Building Authority. So move. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And a second. Second. All right. So a motion by Jen, a second by Nancy. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So that is unanimous. It's quite a mouthful. And maybe um, we could ask, because Megan prepared this, right? Yes, I believe she did. Maybe yes. as a favor to Sue McClure, she could just copy and paste this exact wording and send it to her so she doesn't have to listen to me yes. <laughs> thrown on and try to type. So, okay. Um, all right, so now we are on old business A, the FY19 budget. Um, and Dr. Kavanaugh, I think based on the fact that we're going to meet on Monday and we only got our number last night, I don't anticipate that we really have anything that we can discuss tonight. Does that, is that correct? I'm in agreement, yes. Yeah. I think we have work to do. Yes, <laughs> a lot of work to I, do. I am not able to be at the meeting on Monday, but I d did just want to say that I have concerns about the number that you, the $715,000 that Jean had shared from the letter earlier, N not just in what we're able to do next year, but really I, I can see a ripple effect down this for many, many years to come that it would take to rebuild whatever ends up being cut. And that would be my. I would agree. When we're talking about seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, I think the cuts become so deep that we will start talking about personnel and programs. Right. And I think that's why our work is so difficult. And to try to get personnel and programs back in subsequent years, when we're still trying to do the things that we're doing already, the percent in increase is going to be so high Huge. that it's it's going to be harder then than it is now to pass. Yes. I, just want to put that out there. 
I agree. And for clarification, this is um, not related to the six hundred ish thousand dollars from capital that you were able to figure out. This is unrelated to that, right? They didn't like. I, I I know <laughs> I well, I'm saying it more for the benefit of others. Okay. Yeah, yes. but. But yeah, so the, the, the efforts that you put in for the $600,000 from capital were not acceptable, and so now it's 700 and change from our operating budget. Well, and I think we'll get more explanation about that on Monday. Okay. I think that that's not necessarily entirely true, my okay. understanding is. Like, okay. I think we will be, I'll say this, we actually haven't made any additional votes beyond the original submission of our 7.3 percent operating number even though we've reduced it because of the you know we know we can reduce it because of the bus contract and all of the discussion that we had about the capital articles and freeing up the pay-as-you-go articles in particular we we didn't vote because we were waiting for further direction from the board of selectmen so we haven't voted any changes certainly we have have let them know what we would be comfortable doing um, for this year in terms of capital. And I, I, my sense is that that's not a completed discussion. Um, um, that's correct. So I will share that um, Mr. Kamalo did indicate that the changes that we made with capital will also be part of the solution to balance this budget. Ultimately, the Board of Selectmen have given a directive to come back with a budget that has a 5% tax um, impact. Perfect, yeah. um, so the work that we did with the capital, freeing up free cash, if you will, potentially could become part of the funding scenario to balance and get us to that 5%. So okay. it can be the 715000 cut to the operating and also our changes to the capital. So it's not restricted to the operating? No, she's saying the 715. It could right? be in addition to Correct. what you've already done. So Correct. the good news is you didn't waste your time, but the bad news is That's it's in addition to. Right. Okay. So are other town departments also, have they also been given a number that they, and maybe you don't know, but that they have to work towards as well? So uh, Mr. Kamalo will reduce so as as Jean said in the beginning of the meeting the the reduction to the budget will be reflective of our proportional shares so the town the municipal side will also have a reduction as well I guess I'm just going to add on to that as I'm listening to this and realizing you know reflecting on that meeting from last week that um, if we are making capital reductions, which, you know, we, we've already gone through. Um, but when we did, what we said is we, we, we definitely are kicking some cans down the road. Mm -hmm. So if we are freeing up, if we are if we're going through that exercise to contribute to the bottom line, which is the overall tax impact, um, but that's done by using free cash to offset costs that are in the town budget, and then on top of that, we're reducing our operating budget. We're already, I mean, we're creating the situation that Nancy just described, which is a worse situation for next year, not only in terms of our operating budget and trying to restore whatever it is that we're reducing this year, but in, also in terms of having to make up the difference in our capital, whatever we've postponed in our capital. So I, you know, I'm hopeful that when we have the joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen, on the 20th that we will understand reductions our capital requests already were less um, than the town side capital requests and I'm hoping that you know similar level of scrutiny has been paid um, to those articles as well I'm not assuming that it hasn't been but um, I'm just realizing now that you know the conversation we had was basically how we were going to apportion whatever reductions needed to be made in the operating budgets, but we didn't talk about how reductions in capital budgets were going to be apportioned across the town departments. Um, and so... What I, other town departments will be at this meeting? Only the Board of Select... It's the Board of Selectmen working session that the school committee is invited to. And the other departments who are also working on their budgets there? I mean, if we're... 
you know, not 50-50, I know, but fairly close to 50-50, um, all the rest of the departments and us. Are any of them coming? I mean, we're not organizing the meeting, so I can't answer that question. Okay. I don't know, but I, based on last yeah. week, which was a working session to which we were invited, it was only the school committee and the board of selectmen. Okay. Do they need to be invited, or could they come? It's a public <laughs> meeting. So they could like, come. It feels okay. a little bit like working in silos. Well, and that, that's kind of my yeah. qu question, because... Um, I mean, it's not a question that can be answered here, so I don't want to just talk for the sake of talking about this, but after watching the meeting, I feel like there were some um, departments that were important, departments that were missing from that meeting who um, who have needs too and who have have to address the growth of the, of the community. But, you know, fire wasn't there, um, police, police wasn't there. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'll stop there. Yeah. But I, there are many, several other DPW, you know, there's several other departments in town who, who have significant needs as a result of their growth, as do we. Um, but, you know, for whatever it's worth, it would be great if some of them came so we could all talk together as opposed to yeah. in, in silos, as you said. So I know you can't facilitate that. Yeah. But you know, hey, yeah. whoever's watching this show. Right. I, <laughs> I will down. say, right. you know, all exactly. of those departments are represented in the other portion of the overall town budget. And I think the one, you know, the one distinction um, for the schools that makes us so different is that our, you know, our number is one of many numbers that makes up the overall mm -hmm. town operating budget. But ours is the only one that gets voted separately by a separately elected body right you know what I mean so the fire and the police and DPW and all of the many other town departments come in under the umbrella of the overall town um, department under the direction of the town manager which we don't um, I mean certainly we're included in the overall town budget but we're not under the direction of the town manager right. so you know it may be that the board of selectmen is you know taking because it also was difficult when we had the joint meeting where all of the department heads were there. You know, it's really difficult to have that many people. Too many to, people yeah. to get work okay. done with how many okay. people were at the table? Forty. Um, so you know, that's a that's a hard balance. I don't know. I have one other. I'm sorry. I'm not trying yeah. to make you guys repeat whatever you're going to do on Monday. But my other concern is that in previous years, when we've looked at our budget, we have had the ability to at the end of the year take some year-end balances and prepay special ed transportation which actually for fy18 has given us more money than what our budget line shows and if they're working off of a percent increase that we're allowed to have over last year the actual percent of what we had last year is, is a little bit different if that does that make sense i may have said it in a no i i get what you're about. saying that, that's we're also in a situation as you <laughs> told us at the beginning of the meeting, where we are not going to have that. Right, and um, that, that's, that, that actually is my... Going into FY19. We're not going to have that in FY19, so that's actually a much larger cut. That Some years that amount of money has been significant. We've been able to prepay things for the following year, and the ability to not do that puts us sort of almost like in a deficit right to start. Right, and that's how when we have to respond to unanticipated right. growth the or student hiring of the EL teachers in the middle right. of the year, how would we be able to do that? We don't have the money. No. And yet we still have to do it. We'd have to really comply. comply. <laughs> but, but we'd have to make hard choices on other things in the middle of the year if we don't have that. Mm -hmm. I, I want to add, you know, some of the things that you all been talking about. I wasn't there at the working, last working session, but I did watch the recording. And I completely understand where the Board of Selectmen are coming from, you know, that it's a town problem. We want to limit the taxes. Mm -hmm. I, as a taxpayer, don't want to pay higher taxes if it's possible at all. Right. 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 Um, so I completely understand where they're coming from. At the same time, you know, just seeing the number of children um, that has been growing and, you know, throughout last year you kept presenting at different times, you know, the, whether it's the EL population or the class sizes or, uh, you know, we had uh, Mrs. Bilello come and speak. How many kids have come in just two weeks' time frame? Mm -hmm. So we have heard that again and again and again. Um, so the question is that because this is such an unusual time, and I think you all went in, and I think Mr. Othmanich also did 
uh, looked at the graph as to that this seems like a real anomaly and down the road it, it comes down, it will stabilize. Of course, um, you know, there are projections and projections can change, we understand that. But I, I uh, strongly feel that we can't put our kids at a disadvantage and all the families that are moving into town for the schools, um, you know, to cut down on programs. Um, cut down on teachers, I would have a very hard time with that. And, um, you know, of course, if, if there is anything else, I know you've gone back so many times. If there are other areas, you know, if you think that there are programs which could be deprioritized, I'm sure you'll take a look at that. But I would hope that cutting down on teachers would be the last resort. All right. Um, Thank you for my uh, indulging my tangent. <laughs> no, it's it's not a tangent. It's all related to the budget, and um, so I would imagine that before Monday we'll get something to look at. Uh, and Mrs. Cavanaugh will be traveling, and um, Mr. Graziano is out of town. Hopefully, will be returning to town. But if they have the opportunity to look at the materials and share their feedback with Dr. McLeod prior to the meeting I, on Monday I will night. definitely that would be do great. that if, if there's an ability to, to speak with her or see materials beforehand, I can yeah. communicate with her or any of you to beforehand. Just a general understanding at least, I think. All right, anything else on budget before we move along to um, public comment? And no one from the public is here to compliment us on the fact that we're 45 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll compliment you, Jim. Thank they're, you. They're cheering for us from home. That's right. Um, okay. Well, without further ado, we are on items by consensus. Does anybody have anything that they wanted to pull out for separate consideration? No. All right, Dr. Kavanaugh. Then I will move that. Um, I will recommend that the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So I need a motion. So moved. And a second. A second. Okay, motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, that's unanimous, and we are ready to adjourn at 9.05. I just need a motion. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 And I know no one's opposed, so <laughs> um, thank you very much. We will be, we will meet again on <laughs> Monday and Tuesday, and then we will have our next regular uh, school committee meeting on March 29th, um, marching forward to town meeting. So thank you, as always, to HCAM.